thank you to the praise team for just leading us towards worship this morning. <clears throat> well, fall's almost upon us, and um, although sometimes it doesn't seem like that, except for this cool rain, that feels like fall. Uh, but one of the things that many of you may have done in the fall, and one of the things I've done through my life in the fall, is maybe it's time to go towards the mountains and go on a nice trail hike and see the leaves. I know maybe some of y'all have done that. Uh, we used to do, you know, I must have been young because this sure was stupid. <laughs> but um, one of the guys that was my mentor is Mike Haywood on the peninsula uh, and Tammy's mentor. One of the things that, that he thought was a great thing to do, and we did it for several years. In fact, we would do it, we'd leave Thanksgiving night around midnight and we drive to Rag Mountain. Has anybody hiked Rag Mountain? I see a couple of hands. So we would, we would get to Rag Mountain real you know, early in the morning and walk up. And the plan was we'd get to the very top of it to see the sunrise. And then we'd walk down. So it was a fun hike in the dark, but it sure was dumb. But uh, I learned later on as I got older, I didn't want to leave at midnight and go hike up a mountain in the middle of the night. But somehow, Haywood uh, convinced us to do that. But anytime you're, you're taking a hike like that, whatever time you're doing it, maybe you remember that, um, you know, you, you hike and hike and hike. It's kind of a gradual climb, but you're climbing. And, you know, you start to get out of breath a little bit. Your legs start getting tired. And usually you'll get right to maybe... Um, you know, a few, um, several hundred or thousand yards from the summit. And you've done all this hiking, you're doing this gradual hiking, and then you look up and the worst is yet to come. You know, sometimes you say, oh gosh, now I've got to climb up and over these rocks. Now I've got to go up this steeper path. But I, I've got to take this, uh, this last part of the difficult journey to get to where I'm going, to the top of this mountain, so I can look out on the beauty and the wonder and accomplish my goal. And so, you know, you take a deep breath and you climb the rest of the way. Now, I say that because this passage that we just read, this story about Jesus, kind of begins that way, and I want to set the scene of what's happening with the whole Gospel of Mark in mind, okay? Last week, we looked, and where was Jesus and the inner circle of his disciples? Do you remember? They were on top of the mountain. They were on top of the mountain. They watched Jesus be transfigured, shine before them. I mean, can you imagine the, what we call the spiritual mountaintop experience that they had? That had to be the greatest spiritual experience they had ever seen up to this point. Maybe it's like if you've ever been on a retreat or you've ever been to a, a Christian conference or maybe a men or women's rally and you know, you're just worshiping with hundreds or thousands of people and how wonderful that feels and you're on this spiritual high and everything must be great in the world but you got to come home. <laughs> you know, you have this great experience in worship today, but you got to go back to work, don't you? You got to go back to face whatever's facing you in this sanctuary. Is that we have to come down and off of these mountaintop experiences in life. And spiritual highs are great, but they don't last forever. And it's the same with Jesus and Peter, James, and John. They come, the story begins, they come down from the mountaintop experience. And the rest, the symbolism is the rest of the gospel of Mark is now, from this point forward, they are going to, and Jesus especially, is going to begin the journey to the cross. And for a long time, that's not a high spiritual experience, is it? It's going to be filled with difficulty, with challenges, uh, with stretching faith and, and, and stretching their, their resources and their belief. 
the path for now for these disciples, these followers of Jesus and Jesus, is the path's going to become steeper. It's going to become harder. And boy, they better get stronger in their faith and they better get stronger in their prayer life if they're going to make it. It's not unlike our Christian journeys, is it? It seems the more we commit to Jesus, the the more we're called by Him to sacrifice for the kingdom. That many times, it's unusual, but the challenges become greater. The challenges in our life becomes greater. Maybe we have a family emergency. Uh, Maybe something really is challenging us at work. Maybe we have a financial crisis. Maybe maybe we have a relationship crisis. Uh, Maybe we just have a spiritual crisis in our life where we doubt for a while. We, We just don't know where to turn. And maybe we get an obstacle put in our life that that we just think is impossible, but it is probable. The Christian life is filled with joy and mountaintop experiences, but it's also filled with challenges. And that's what the story's about today. And what we need in times like this is we need more faith, and we need to believe more, and we need, need more audacious prayer. And that's what the lesson today is about. So let's look and see what confronts Jesus when he comes down from that mountain. So the the narrative begins there in verse 14, is that Jesus gets to the bottom of the mountain with his disciples, and what he notices is, is a tense situation. The teachers of the law are surrounding the other nine disciples, and they're in midst of an argument. And... um, he also sees a dad and, and, and a little boy that's just in terrible pain and dealing with a terrible illness. And he sees a crowd beginning to gather around the whole thing. And, you know, this is a situation. Anxiety's going through the roof. Um, you know, it's kind of like something small might happen in a church and all of a sudden it gets blown out of proportion. You know, uh, tempers are rising here. Things aren't looking good. And um, he also sees these teachers of the law, these Pharisees, these scribes. And boy, now where they really didn't care about Jesus and the disciples or kind of put them off, they're taking a keen interest in them now because the disciples are in the midst of failure. And they're gleefully nagging these disciples and they're gleefully quizzing them. Boy, I thought you were with Jesus. You know, I I thought you guys could do anything. I thought there was nothing you couldn't do. You certainly can't heal this little boy. What's up with that? I thought you were here today. I thought you were a Christian. What do you mean you're having a problem with your marriage? What do you mean that, uh, that you're having a problem with your business? What do you mean that your children are doing this or that? What do you mean you're struggling with this and that? I thought you were a Christian. I thought with Jesus you can do anything. You heard that before? The naysayers of the world can come out quick. But the Bible says the first thing is Jesus comes down and the first thing to remember is his presence begins immediately to take control of the situation. It says the crowds are awed by his presence. The, the, the crowds now begin to focus on him and not the other nine. The crowd begins to focus on him and not uh, the naysayers and the problems. And the first thing is when we pray and we ask Jesus' presence to come in the midst of what we're dealing with, Jesus is, a, is one that, that can help us lower the anxiety of the situation we're in. It helps us gain perspective. We need other things to help us. You know, we need uh, a lot of things Tammy teaches, mindfulness. We need to to make sure about our long time, our long-term mental health maybe, and what's going on and see if we need somebody to talk to. But Jesus just magnifies all of these other tools and resources that we have. His presence begins to take control of the situation. And he comes in and he basically asks, what's going on? And, and, and the father of this little boy begins to describe this tragic illness and situation of his son that, um, 
he, he, he claims it's an evil spirit. And in that day, that's what they really believed. And, and maybe some of that's going on. And we, we see it today probably more as some type of epilepsy, right? Some type of seizures that this boy is having. And they're trying to explain it the best they can in their world and with their medical knowledge. But we know that, that whatever it is, this father is is just observing this tragic illness, this tragic situation of his son where no cure can be found for him for years. Can you imagine that? We saw it with, with the, in our own church with somebody whose son was just desperately ill for a long time. We see the pain of a mom who learns their, their daughter and granddaughter's in an accident. It breaks our heart quick. It stays with us. It hurts us, doesn't it, when our family hurts? And is ill. And that's what happens. And so there, what this situation causes is a lack of faith. And, and Jesus basically says that. He, he comes into the situation and many times he comes into our lives. And the first thing he wants to tell us, and it's not a rebuke, but he wants to remind us, hey, don't lose your faith. Hey, there's a lack of faith going on here. And, you know, include me again. I'm here, remember? I've come into your presence. And he basically says it by, oh, how long am I going to have to stay with this generation? How long, how many times are you going to have to see me feed the 5,000? How many times are you going to have to see me heal the deaf and the mute and the lame? How long before you believe in my power and in the power of prayer? And this was a case then, this story becomes, Jesus indicates, a case of lack of faith. Not a rebuke, just an observation. And it also reminds us that, that we too can always come to Jesus. And it's always best to come to Jesus when other things fail us. And we'll see that more in a minute. And so after he says this, we, we see with just touching tenderness, the father makes a plea to Jesus to have mercy on his son, to have mercy on him and help him. Have you been at that point ever when, when you just pleaded with mercy to Jesus about something that's going on in your life? You know, I mean, you, you, you knew that nobody else... Nothing else, no other power was going to be able to help this situation that you're in but Jesus. And the dad just pleads with the father's love, help me, Lord, in this situation. I'm out of options. I'm out of options. And even though Jesus is going to help the boy, he, he wants to let the father know that that he has a part in this, and, and, and he challenges the father's faith here. And he says, you know, all things are possible with faith. All things are possible with belief. Can you believe? And I think one of the great responses in Scripture, right, an honest response from this dad, have we not said this many times in our life? Oh, Jesus, I believe but with this loud, you know, literally the scripture, the language, the, the Greek here says, with a loud cry, with tears in his eyes, with agony in his voice. He says, I believe, but Jesus, help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. Because we as men and women and teenagers and boys and girls, we're still human. Our capability, our level of belief sometimes can only go so far, can it? And at some point, faith, the belief in the unknown, the, the belief in a higher power, the belief in God Almighty, the belief in Jesus has to take over, doesn't it? And we have to say to ourselves, oh, I believe, but Lord, help my unbelief. That's where I am. And what an honest prayer that is, isn't it? What an earnest prayer. 
This man has faith, but he craves more. And that's where God wants us. He wants us to have faith, but he wants us to have more. He wants us to have faith, but, but God doesn't want us to think that, that we've discovered all the faith there is and have all the answers because we don't. And I think he loves it when we cry. Oh, Lord, I believe, I'm believing, but boy, help my unbelief. Help me to have more. Help me to have more. You see, Jesus goes on to teach. Prayer is what they say. Lord, uh, after Jesus heals the boy and they're alone, and, and they say, Lord, why we, couldn't we do it? Why couldn't we remove this spirit? Why couldn't we help this situation? And Jesus says, well, prayer and faith is what you lacked. Prayer and faith is what you lacked. That was what was missing. They were powerless because they were prayerless. They may, as we are and sometimes as Christians and sometimes as church, they, they had, you know, you get all this confidence and you see all these good things happening because of Jesus. and All of a sudden we think it's us, <laughs> you know. And, and sometimes we, it transfers and we begin to have too much faith in ourselves and too little faith in Jesus. And so Jesus says another great verse in Scripture, right? He says, you know, in things like this, some things can only be taken care of in prayer. Some things can only be settled, can only be healed by prayer. What a great thing for us to hear, right? It says we need to believe in prayer. What does that mean? We need to believe in audacious prayer. We need to believe that prayer works. We need to realize that there are many situations in life where only prayer can make a difference. There's many situations in life where we have no control. Only prayer can make a difference. Sometimes it's matters of health. Sometimes it's matters when the force of God's nature becomes so powerful. Boy, we think that we don't need faith anymore. We have all this technology. We have all this electricity. We have all of these, these structures that are, that are uh, built with concrete and up on stilts. And God's nature blows through in a hurricane and it's gone in days. And once again we say, Oh God, I believe. Help my unbelief. Help us from this day forward. And so we we'll realize once again we're saved by Jesus as Christians not to sit but to serve. And, and thousands of Christians are going to mobilize now to help show people where God is in the aftermath of a storm of His might and His power. And only prayer is going to get many families through this crisis. They don't have anything else. But your prayers and my prayers and their prayers are going to get them through, many of them. And they'll have living rooms they can sit in again one day. And they'll have homes that they can sleep in one day because of prayer. We need to know that, that our human plans for spiritual awakening, spiritual revival, for church renewal, for church growth, and, and um, for sharing Jesus and seeing more people come to this place to worship Him are always only going to happen through prayer. Yes, we need to have vision. Yes, we need to make plans. Yes, we have to have goals and strategic planning. But in the end, we need prayer, don't we? Some things can only happen with prayer. And you know, let's remember the gospel is being written to prove that Jesus is Lord, is the Son of God, that is the only way to salvation. And the biggest need, the biggest thing in life, in eternal life, that can only happen through prayer is salvation, isn't it? 
You and I cannot save ourselves. <laughs> you and I cannot forgive ourselves of our sin. You and I cannot give ourselves eternity with God. Some things can only be taken care of and healed by prayer. And that's the way it was with your salvation. Only when and if you pray, Jesus, forgive me of my sin, become the Lord of my life, save me, can you take care of that. There's power in prayer. I love this old story. I may have told it to you before. It's about Jeremy Lamphere. Jeremy lived in, and, and, and at this point in the story is 1857. Late, well, about this time, September 23rd. What's today? Okay, next Sunday, anniversary of it. Jeremy lived in New York, and he was a part of a denomination of church. But in this time in our history, think about 1857, many people thought the country was falling apart. It was in spiritual decline. It was in political decline. It was in economic decline. In a year, they would have a market crash. In four years, they'd be embroiled in a civil war. Churches were failing. People were not coming to church. They were giving up on God. Tendance was going down. People wondered if the church would survive, if, if, yeah, would the doors close on every church. A little group in New York City in Manhattan asked Jeremy, he was a layman, not a professional minister, would, um, would he think about visiting and figuring out something to get people back to church and thinking about God again. And so he began this great visitation program, visiting, 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 inviting people to church and marketing, doing everything he could think of, and nobody was coming to church. It wasn't working. They weren't listening to him. So he puts up this, this ad, and he says, Anybody that wants to meet me for prayer, to pray for a revival and renewal for New York City and for our nation, meet me on September 23rd at lunchtime for prayer at this abandoned building. And he throws out flyers and he invites the whole city. And he, it comes that time for people to meet for prayer and he has six people show up. And he said, well, six people are six people. And they pray. And he says, we're going to meet here every week. A month later, the stock market crashes. The next time at prayer meeting, he has 60 that show up for prayer. Word begins to spread. In, in two months, 10,000 people are showing up for prayer at his prayer meeting and prayers throughout the churches in New York City. In a year, when the nation goes and, and gets ready for its deeper depression that they've seen in a long time, hundreds of thousands are flocking back to churches. It's called the first great revival in American history. People are coming back to the Lord. People that have been Christians and left the church and forgotten the church are coming back and renewing their commitment to God. New people are coming to salvation. And it just doesn't stop in America. It's the first spiritual revival renewal in American history that goes worldwide. And churches in England and Wales and Europe begin to flourish and grow. All because six people showed up to pray. You see, some things, Jesus said, can only happen through prayer. Some things are just up to God and up to our faith and up to our unbelief. But we can't, but we don't believe God can do. God can do. Will you join me in prayer? Not right, we'll pray in a minute, but praying 
If you hear about Fairview praying, will you come and pray? Will you pray audaciously? Will you pray for things that, that you, you don't even think God can do, but he can do it? Will you pray for things in your own life that you think are hanging in the balance or God can't do? Will you pray for those audaciously? Because some things only can happen through prayer. Let's believe in prayer. And let's not think that God can't handle anything. That's why Mark put this narrative in his gospel. We're going to pray and as our praise team comes up and we're going to pray even as we sing and we're going to thank God for a God that remembers us in prayer. Let's pray together. God, we come to you and we just bring our lives to you. I know there's all kinds of need right in this room. People that are praying to you for things that they don't have a way out of, that they don't understand, that, uh, that are beyond their control. Uh, God, may they have faith in you and realize that some things are only possible through you and through prayer. Lord, um, do great miracles and let us begin a great revival in this community, in this city, in this nation, in this world. Not by what we do, but because of what you can do. Lord, we, um, we worship you now through this song and open our hearts, eyes, and ears to what you tell us from your word today. In Jesus' name, amen.